so welcome uh, everyone uh, for the evening session so it is a uh, pleasure to introduce professor uh, dietrich leifrit he is from the national institute of standards and technology boulder colorado where he leads his own group on quantum information processing using trap science he is also a lecturer at the university of colorado he has been working at nist from 2011 alongside se se uh, several pioneers in the field of trap science he is a fellow of the american physical society and has received numerous awards which i am not going to list he has worked on various aspects of ion trapping and made seminal contributions to the field of quantum information processing using trap ions this included the demonstration of high fidelity logic gates and the implementation and application of entangled states addressing of single ions in a ion string eit cooling of ions quantum logic spectroscopy quantum teleportation scalable ion traps and so on many of the techniques pioneered in the group are now routinely used in many labs around the world he has also recently been working on molecular ions as well and performed some really cool experiments on a different note he has been very supportive and ex extremely enthusiastic about this school with these few words i welcome professor leifrit to deliver his lecture so hello everyone and thank you for joining us in the evening for you in india and in the morning for me here in the us i'll share my screen now so first of all it's an honor to be in this school and i hope that you will benefit from this talk the plan is to tell you all the things that you usually do not get when you read a paper about trap ions these days because basically a lot of things are assumed already when you read these papers approximations have been made and there is just a, a lot of things going on under the hood of of the paper and it's much easier to follow papers if you actually know roughly at least what's under the hood and so that's what i'm trying to tell you today the talk is in four parts two are today and the other two will be in the next lecture to tomorrow and so we will start with just the bare bones of what does an ion trap look like for a theory then we will go on to laser cooling and then in the lecture tomorrow i'll talk about the cooling of ion crystals so more than one ion and then also about a primitive that is used in quantum information processing experiments at nist and also becoming more routine in other places and it even has been picked up by industry by honeywell in particular and that is using ion transport and separation for quantum information processing i would encourage you to ask questions and the way we are going to do this is you can put your questions in the chat and then about every quarter of the lecture uh, there will be a, a good time to pause and, and ask questions and then i'll ask my chair to actually read the questions to me and i'll try to answer them you also don't have to note down the list of reviews that you can see here i should actually grab the laser pointer that you can see here it's also in the abstract of this talk so don't worry about it and the final thing i want to say a lot of the basics that i'm talking about today in this lecture can be found in this review of modern physics here so you can look up a lot of the details that maybe i can't talk about because there's not enough time all right so with that let's get started basically i'm not going to tell you every detail of what an ion trap looks like i want you for the sake of time here to believe me that the ions are confined in something that looks very much like a harmonic potential there are a few details that come about because in reality it's an rf pseudo potential that the ions are confined in in at least two dimensions sometimes in three dimensions but for all practical purposes for almost everything i'm going to tell you about it's good enough to think of the ion trap 
as confining the ions in a harmonic oscillator potential. So you have equidistant energy levels and the Hamiltonian looks like this. There is the trap frequency and the sum here is for a single ion over three spatial dimensions. For more ions, it would be an index for the ions and also for the dimensions. And then there's a, a destruction and a creation operator, A dagger and A, and that's basically the external potential. That's the first part of the Hamiltonian that ions or a single ion see from the trapping potential. For the internal states, most atomic ions that we use are rather complicated. They have hyperfine states and they have electronic structure. They can have metastable states and so on. But typically it's enough to forget about all these states and just concentrate on two of them. And I will call them G for ground state and E for excited state here. What this exactly is, it can be a lot of different states and we'll talk about that. But basically for now, we have two selected levels here, E and G, and that makes up the internal state Hamiltonian HE here. And then the final ingredient that makes it actually fun to work with ions is that you can have interactions with them. You can manipulate their states with light or with microwaves. And there are many different ways how you can do light and in this interaction. You can have a carrier transition, for example, that is where you are only talking to the internal levels. You can also have sideband transitions where you're talking to the internal levels and the harmonic oscillator. And then finally, there's something called a coherent drive where you're only talking to the harmonic oscillator. In addition, what exactly the nature of these two states is determines what kind of interactions you're using. The most simple one is a dipole transition. So that would be between, for example, a ground S state and an excited P state. It has to be odd parity, then you can do a dipole transition. Or if it's hyperfine ground states, which are very popular in some QIP experiments, you can use Raman transitions. And finally, also very popular in other QIP experiments, you can have metastable excited D states, for example. In that case, it would be a quadrupole transition. The reason that these states are metastable is that they are dipole forbidden. So their decay has to be through a quadrupole transition. And if you want to excite them, that's also the most convenient way. So these kind of interactions make up the interaction Hamiltonian HI. And I'll explain each of these in more detail. Let's start with the internal states, the harmonic oscillator, there's not too much to say about other than what I already said. It's basically equidistant energy levels and you can use the ladder operators. For the internal states, it's a two level system and any two level systems can be described by matrices that have four entries and any of such matrices can be expanded in this Pauli matrices. And in particular, if you look at an excited state E and a ground state G, like here, you can write the following equalities. First of all, if you have the projectors of those two states, and this is all you care about, then basically this gives you an identity for the internal states, GG plus EE, these two projectors give you an identity. The next thing is if you want to look at off diagonals, that would be the Pauli sigma X and sigma Y operators. You can rewrite them in the G and E states like this I times GE minus EG is the Pauli sigma Y and GE plus EG is sigma X. Finally, there's one diagonal operator in the Pauli matrices, the sigma C, and that is this combination, EE minus GG. And so in this way, you can introduce the Pauli matrices now written in terms of these internal states, G and E. If you think about the Hamiltonian that describes the energy, of course, that can be mapped 
onto the sigma c. And the way you do that is, is you expand this in the i, and you can then remove the part that is proportional to the identity because that's a constant energy term. If you think about this here, it doesn't matter whether you're in the G or the E state, you can just sort of take this energy into account and then you can remove it because it doesn't play a role in the, in the dynamics. It doesn't matter which state you're in, you always have this energy and so you might as well not use it. But then you also have the Sigma Z and basically you're going into a, a picture where you're in the middle between the excited and the ground state. So if you're in the ground state, you have omega over two. Omega is the splitting between the two levels. And if you're in the excited state, you have plus omega over two, minus omega over two here, plus omega over two here. And in short, in the Pauli notation, that would be h bar omega over two times sigma c. That's your internal Hamiltonian after you took care of this constant energy term and removed it. So now we've taken a, a good notation of the internal levels. Just to tell you what you can do with this really simple description is you can actually cover a lot of cases. For example, you can describe hyperfine qubits in this way. A qubit is basically just another word for a two level system. So it could be a nuclear spin, it could be the electron spin. And the species that are used in this way or some popular ones, it's not a, uh, a complete list, is beryllium, magnesium 25, cadmium 111, zinc, barium, ytterbium 171 is very popular. It could also be an optical qubit or and a hyperfine qubit. So examples for that is calcium 43, which is used in experiments in Oxford, for example, strontium 87, or it could also be mercury 199, which was a popular clock for a while, and it's not so popular anymore. And finally, it could be purely optical qubits. So examples for that is calcium 40, which doesn't have a nuclear spin, so there are no hyperfine levels, or 88 strontium. And so in this case, it's an excited D state and the ground S state that forms these qubits. And there are a bunch, bunch of more, but these are probably the most popular. I apologize if someone's favorite qubit is not on this list. In any case, now comes the interesting part. You would like to actually manipulate these states. And we can do this, for example, with electric fields. And typically it's light fields. Um, this example here is that you have a plane wave of an electric field that has an amplitude E0 and the polarization is also basically encoded in the fact that this is a vector quantity and it's propagating as the plane wave. So Kx minus omega T. And so we assume that this omega here is already pretty close to the transition here. It could be resonant or it could be close to resonant. And the trick now is that you would like to describe how this light field couples the ground and the excited state. Even intuitively, you want to use operators of the type EG and GE for that. Because basically, if I plug in a ground state on this side here, I get an excited state out. And if I plug in an excited state on this one, I'll get a ground state out. So clearly, this describes transitions. And to formalize that, we can do the following. We basically expand an arbitrary state in this identity here. And then we look at the matrix element of the interaction Hamiltonian with the states that are represented here. There would also be diagonal elements here. If in some cases, for example, for Raman transitions, you would have also diagonal elements. Those are then AC Stark shifts if you take the matrix elements of GG and EE here, and you can basically put them into the energy of the states to begin with. And so in this way, they're taken care of. You're just changing the energy of the states a little bit by that. The important ones that make the transitions have this form here. So you have G and E 
and you look at the matrix element with the interaction Hamiltonian. And what that looks like depends on what kind of electric field you're exactly using and what the nature of these states here is. So this is described in more detail here. We are looking at some typical cases for what can these matrix elements look like. For example, the simplest one is a dipole coupling. The dipole coupling is proportional to the position of the electron. So that's Xe here. And basically you just do a scalar product between the position of the electron and the electric field. The physics idea behind that is, is that the electric field grabs on to the electron and moves it around. So that's a very classical way of thinking about it, but that helps you to understand what's happening here. And of course, it's all quantum mechanical in the end. And so it's not just the position, it's a wave function of the electron, but this basic idea is very useful. The electric field grabs on to the electron and it moves it around. And if that happens at the right frequency, you can make a transition. And here's just the plane wave part of the field again. We then introduce a quantity we call the Rabi frequency. And basically this is just the charge times this matrix element here. G and E are here. And then we have E zero times XD. We basically exclude the exact nature of the field, whether it, it's a plane wave, as in this case, it could be also a slightly different situation. It could be a Gaussian beam or something like that. But the point is you take the amplitude of the field, including its polarization, and you put it in this matrix element and you call this whole thing here, the Rabi frequency or in particular this. So there's the translation between a frequency and an energy of course, H bar over two here. So that's a dipole transition. For a quadrupole coupling, it's more complicated. The quadrupole coupling is a tensorial coupling. So the position of the electron actually shows up two times here. It's a higher order in the electric field. And what you can already see from that is, is that it's harder to make this transition. And it's basically this factor here, which is proportional to something like the extent of the electronic wave function and the wavelength of the light K. And of course, the, this extent is much smaller than the wavelength and therefore it's a smaller term than say a dipole transition. Quadrupole transitions are a lot weaker, but you can still drive them and they're still very useful. And as you can also already see here, it's a little more complicated. The electrons, if you wish, will make a more complicated dance, but the basic idea remains the same as for the dipole. You separate the spatial dependence of the field and then call this whole thing here, uh, Rabi frequency. And it looks like this. So this is the Rabi frequency for a quadrupole transition. Just to make things even a little more complicated, you can now look at Raman transitions. In Raman transitions, you're using more than a single field. You're using two electric fields, E1 and E2. And typically the idea is that these excited and ground states are a lot closer together than an optical transition. For example, they could be hyperfine ground states of an atom. And so this omega is maybe not many terahertz, but it could be a few gigahertz, for example, much, much smaller frequency. And the trick, so you can make the transition is that you choose the electric field frequencies in such a way that their frequency difference corresponds to the transition you want to make. So basically you have omega one here, omega two here, and omega, the transition you want to make is the difference of the two. And of course, now you have to think about what does that mean for the momentum for the K vectors. In essence, the description doesn't change very much from what it was for a dipole transition it's just, again, the difference of the two wave vectors, delta K, that comes in for the Raman coupling. And I'll explain a little more how it comes in. 
in a moment. And actually, this is a nice property of Raman transitions. It makes you very flexible in terms of how much momentum you want to put on the atom when you do such a transition. But let's delay that discussion a little bit now and talk more about the energy part. So basically, there are two photons. One of them is absorbed, and the other one is stimulated into the second field. So their momenta will, not, uh, um, will add up, actually, in this case. And their energies will subtract from each other. The Rabi frequency is, can be computed by looking at how do I couple to, say, a level three and three just stands for any excited level, but often there's one that's close by, and so it takes the main contribution of this. And there's a detuning big delta, which is typically much larger than all the other Rabi frequencies and also this omega here. And in such a case, you can write the effective Rabi frequency as the pr product of the Rabi frequencies of a dipole transition and divided by this detuning here. This is done by a technique called adiabatic elimination, for example. In this way, you can derive this expression here. And then finally, there's also a phase between the two fields. Each of them has its own phase. I've just written this equal to zero, and here's delta phi. And so that also comes in. That's also different from having a single photon where you would only have a single phase. Here you have the difference of two phases. Now, finally, let me explain why it's nice to have a Raman transition in terms of tailoring how much momentum you transfer. Assume that this is a really small frequency, something like a gigahertz, and these are optical frequencies. What that means is that if I have the 2K vectors co-propagating. So this light field and this light field go in the same direction. Then you are stimulate, um, you're absorbing this photon and you're stimulating this photon, which means in one case, the atom absorbs the momentum and in the other case, the atom has to pay for this momentum because it's a stimulated photon. So the difference is almost exactly zero, which means I can make this transition without supplying any momentum to the atom. Or I can also make these two beams counter propagating. Now, when I stimulate, I actually add to the photon that I've, to the momentum of the photon that I've absorbed. And so in this case, I get a very large momentum transfer. And basically by using the angle, changing the angle between these two electric fields, I can get any situation from almost no momentum to essentially two times the momentum from one of these photons. And this is very nice if you want to decide whether you want to affect the motion. In that case, you would choose a very large K. It just will become more clear later on. Or you want to leave the motion alone. You don't want to talk to the motion. Then you would use this case where you're very close to zero. All right. So I think this is a good time to pause for questions the first time. OK, so uh, we have two questions in the chat box. Uh, the first one is, uh, if we consider a single ion, what does this Pauli matrices notation mean? Is it simply chance of occurrence, or is it deterministic. So if you consider a single ion, it has to have some internal structure. So there should be internal energy levels, for example, electronic excitations or hyperfine levels. And the Pauli operators are just a short notation for saying, I have only two states that I'm interested in. And basically, this just says something about the light fields or the microwave fields that you want to interact, to use to interact with this atom. If these fields only talk to two levels, you can use the Pauli matrices. And maybe the best way to think about them here is 
that the four uh, the three Pauli matrices plus the identity, those are four matrices, and they are a complete basis for any operator between two states. So the way we use the Pauli matrices here is to expand any operator that we could have between these two states. And we can use the Pauli matrices as a basis for this expansion. And in particular, the transitions are by given, the transitions are modeled by the X and Y Pauli matrices. The internal states are modeled by Sigma Z. And then the ident identity of, of course is nice because it's an operator that doesn't depend on which state you are in. So that's how the Pauli matrices are used. Okay, so there's one more. Uh, uh, experimentally, what do you do differently uh, compared to dipole case to drive the quadruple transitions? Do you have to rely on strong focus fields or something else? So the dipole transitions can be driven with relatively weak fields compared to the quadrupole transitions. That's the correct observation. You have to use much stronger fields. They are not impractically strong. That's what I want to say. Just to give you an, an experimental scale, there's in dipole transitions, because they typically decay, what we in, in experiments use is the so-called saturation intensity. And you can reach the saturation intensity by focusing a few microwatts of light from a laser into about 20 micrometers. So that's just using a relatively normal lens, mm -hmm. say 10, 15 centimeter uh, focal length. And you focus a few microwatts, then you can saturate the dipole transition. For the quadrupole transition, you need quite a bit more power. It's about milliwatts or so into a similar focus. So you need a much stronger light field for quadrupole transitions. And then because it's a tensor coupling, there are also more ways you can couple. The selection rules are more open. You can have delta m equals two, for example, in, in terms of angular momentum. You can bring in or subtract more angular momentum with the quadrupole transitions. Those are the main differences when you do experiments. Okay, I think we can, uh, okay, some more questions are popping up, but I think we can go ahead and take them slightly later. Or All if right. you want, yeah, let's go ahead. I think I will continue then. Yes, please. So now comes maybe the most interesting part. How do we actually model these transitions and what transitions are possible given the tools that I've explained so far. So basically here, we are back to this is essentially sigma x here, ge plus eg, and we can break it down even more. We can call one a sigma plus. So it's this combination here and then sigma minus and this, in the G and E notation, this is just G, E, and E, G. You might ask yourself, why do we have to break this down even further? The reason for that is that when I look at the interaction Hamiltonian, there's quite a few terms here. You have to multiply all this out. And in, in essence, you get four terms from that. In the interaction picture, one does something called the rotating wave approximation. So what's, what does the interaction picture mean? In, in essence, we have H0, which is the Hamiltonian without the light field. It's just the motion and the internal energy. And to describe transitions, it's not really necessary to carry these uncoupled states around. And that's where the interaction picture comes in very handily we can go in what's called a rotating frame. And what you do for that is, is you take this Hamiltonian of the uncoupled system and you make a unitary out of it as this exponent of the uncoupled Hamiltonian. And then you put this unitary around the interaction Hamiltonian. 
This will allow you to identify which of the terms in the interaction Hamiltonian are important and actually will contribute to your transition and which of them are not important. This looks a little messy, but as I already explained, it will basically come down to terms that are close to resonance and terms that are very far off resonance. Basically, you have omega zero here, which is the bare transition, and you have omega, which is the light field. And if you look at all these exponents here, you can imagine they basically multiply together, which means you take their sum, or it could also be a difference. And if you have the difference between omega naught and omega, that's a term that could be pretty close to resonance. While if you have the sum omega naught plus omega, let's say in this term and this term, then that's a very large frequency. It's basically two times an optical frequency. So these terms rotate extremely fast and can be neglected in this rotating frame. This is what's called the rotating wave approximation. I just multiply all of this stuff here and I only keep the terms that rotate slowly at the difference of these two frequencies. I also have the motional Hamiltonian in this H naught here because the motional energy also is there without having it coupled by a light field. And that doesn't do a lot. It basically just acts on these position operators here. And what it does is it transforms the ladder operators from the Schrodinger to the Heisenberg picture. So a time independent ladder operator like this one, once you dress it with the motional Hamiltonian gives you a time dependent operator. So this is exactly what you expect to happen when you go from Schrodinger picture where the operators are time independent to the Heisenberg picture where the operators are time dependent. And so that's all that happens because of HM. And then because of HE, you get fast rotating and slow rotating terms and you only keep the slow rotating. It's a bit of algebra, but it's not too hard. And after that, actually things become a lot simpler. The other thing that is done at this point is that you look at the scalar product of the wave vector with the precision of the atom. So you can write this as the modulus of these two vector quantities times the angle between them. And then finally, you can expand X here or you can substitute X with its quantum mechanical in the Heisenberg picture form. So that's here, the position operator and X zero is the ground state extent of the wave function. So all we've done here is, is we've taken X and put in the quantum mechanical position operator for the ion here. And finally, the product of K and X zero, so that's the modulus of the wave vector and the ground state extent is called eta and we call it the lamp Dicke parameter. This is a very important quantity that shows up in all the papers. And basically the idea is that X zero is typically relatively small, 10 nanometers or so, and the K vector has a wavelength in it that is much larger than that. Even if you have ultraviolet light, it's probably a few hundred nanometers. And so basically eta is a small parameter and that will allow us to do expansions. This interaction pictures and the terms that rotated at optical frequencies suppressed now, the interaction Hamiltonian is relatively simple. It looks like this. There's the Rabi frequency here that determines of how strongly you couple the two levels, sigma plus, and then in the Hermit conjugate, the sigma minus tell you that you're going from G to E or E to G. And then you have this exponential function here that describes the detuning. How far is my light field detuned from the internal transition? And here's the spatial part with this lambda key parameter. Again, this is just a rewrite of the position operator times the K vector. That's all there is to it. Because eta is typically a small quantity, 
we can expand in the lambda key parameter. Here's just a pictorial representation of what I already told you. The ground state extent of the ion's wave function in the trap is much smaller than the wavelength of the light that we use. And so this lambda key parameter is smaller than one by quite a bit typically. It's typically on the order of a few percent to a few per mil. And that means we can expand in this parameter and this looks pretty terrible maybe, but it's actually relatively easy to understand what's going on here. The higher order you go in the lambda key parameter, the higher this M is, the smaller this quantity will get. And there's also an M factorial that drives it down very quickly. So what you expect if the lambda key parameter is not too large is that even the second and third order will be very suppressed compared to the first order. And the first order is much smaller than the zero order, which we call the carrier. In any case, if you want to keep track of these terms, you can look at resonance conditions. If this delta here will be similar to these frequencies here taken to the mth power, you can be on resonance with the M sideband. So basically M times the motional frequency minus this tuning should be roughly zero. Then you're resonant with the M blue sideband, but it could be very weak because of this attenuation factor. And then there's also this condition here where you basically your detuning is negative. It could be ne a negative M times new here. And we call that the M threat sideband. These higher orders, typically drop very quickly, as I already said. So most of the time, you don't have to worry about large Ms. And then finally, you can look at the matrix elements of the number of Fox states. If the detuning is close to S an integer, S times new, you're on the S sideband. And what happens there is because these ladder operators show up I should go here to the mth power, you can couple states that are different from n to n plus s or n to n minus s. And it depends on whether you go to from g to e or e to g. But basically that's the idea here. If, on, if s is an integer and it's s times the emotional frequency and your detuning is similar to that, you're driving the s sideband and the Rabi frequency can be expressed analytically. It doesn't matter whether you go up or down, it's the same Rabi frequency and it's given by this rather complicated expression. This here is a generalized Laguerre polynomial. It's nice that you can express it in, in a closed form at all. So it, this is used very often in, in theoretical papers. And then finally, I should say, this notation works in the following way, n smaller or n larger is the lesser or the greater of n plus s plus n, because s could be a negative integer. So it's not clear which of them is larger. So in this way, you can get these matrix elements and you can calculate for almost arbitrary light fields and motional states by expanding them in these number of states or a number of bases, you can calculate what their Rabi frequencies is and what kind of transitions you are driving. Oftentimes, you don't have to be quite that complicated. In particular, if the ion is already pretty close to the ground state, we can use an experimental technique we call Doppler cooling. I'll explain what that is in a moment. And then we go to a regime where the ion is already confined to a region that's much smaller than the optical wavelength. Again, the ground state extension is about 10 nanometers, while the wavelengths can be in a lot of places between, say, 280 and 900 nanometers. Maybe there are even more extreme ones, but let's put it this, this way. The point is that any of these numbers here is much small, larger than 10 nanometers, and so the Lambdicki parameter is small, and we can actually expand just to the first order. So zero order, we get a one. And then to first order, we just have a single eta here and we have the position operator in essence here and just uh, the delta here that has to be 
close to resonance with the news here, one of them. And you can already see what happens here maybe. There are two cases that are important for this expanded version. If it's one, delta should be close to zero. And when delta is exactly zero, it means you're in resonance with the two internal states. And we call that a carrier transition. So for delta roughly equals to zero, you just change the internal state. There's a one for the emotional state, nothing happens to it. For these terms here, you can either be in resonance with this term or this term. And depending on which one it is, you will drive the blue sideband where you're changing the internal state by one motional quantum positively while you drive from the ground state to the excited state or the red sideband where you actually subtract emotional quantum when you go from ground state to excited state. And in equations that is just written out here. So basically the main thing you want to look at here is this combination, sigma plus, which means I go from the ground state to the excited state and a dagger. That means I'm adding a photon a motional quantum while I'm going from G to E. One more remark here, you've maybe heard of the James Cummings Hamiltonian. This is basically this Hamiltonian here, and that makes trapped ions very similar to two level atoms in a cavity. You can basically subtract a phonon from the motion of the ion and then go from G to E, that's this term here. And this is very similar of an atom being driven in a cavity where it can take a photon out of the cavity and go to ex excited state, or it can do the opposite. It adds a photon to the cavity and goes to the ground state. And you can basically mimic that with an ion on the red side band. All right. So just to give you a few more rules here, the red side band Hamiltonian looks like this. We've just talked about it. It's very similar to the James Cummings and it drives transitions from going the internal ground state to the excited state and subtracting a photon. And uh, Ravi frequencies in this expansion order look like this. You can again see here why it's so similar to the chains Cummings. You get the square root of N, which some people call bosonic stimulation. So just the fact that you change from N to N plus one gives you the square root of N. And then for the blue side band, that's basically, and sometimes people call it the anti chains Cummings Hamiltonian. When you go from G to E, you add a motional quantum and you get this Rabi frequency. One is square root N, one is square root N plus one. And then of course there's the carrier. You do nothing to the motion. It doesn't play a role. It just hangs on here and does nothing. And you go from G to E. And this is the strongest Rabi frequency in this limit because the other ones are multiplied by eta, unless N is so large that it overcompensates for eta, but then you're not in the Lambdicky regime anymore. So this is something to keep in mind. It's not enough to just say eta is small. Also, the motional state has to be reasonably small. The ends that play a role have to be small enough that this product here is not close to one. It should be smaller than one. Otherwise, the Lambdicky regime is not applicable. All right, so let's assume we are in the Lambdicky regime. Let's see what happens to the state evolution. Basically, a general state can be written as a sum of ground states and different ends and excited states and different ends. And then we just have to give it coefficients that can potentially change in time because we're driving transitions. And I just sum over all the motional states here. Of course, the sum might be broken off in practice a lot earlier than infinity because I already told you this expansion only works if n is not too large. In any case, you can plug this ansatz into the Schrodinger equation, and then you can assume that you're close to the elf sideband. So this all looks pretty complicated, but don't worry too much about it. It's really just algebra. And it's telling you that I can write this down in a closed form and I can actually solve this equation. The solution 
can be written in a matrix form. So basically I'm just coupling two states here because I'm close to the outside band. It's N plus L and N, and it's coupled by this maybe complicated looking matrix, but it's really not so bad. All it describes is a transition from this state to this state here. And there's also a generalized Ravi frequency. So you can use this equation when you're not exactly on resonance. And this is given by this term here. So in this way, you can write down the state evolution, the Ravi flopping on resonance or slightly detuned from resonance from any sideband. And that's pretty nice because it covers a lot of cases that you would like to describe in theory. We can now visualize these states here. Let me just go back for a sec here. As I said, there's N plus L and N involved here and then E and G. So it's just two levels that are coupled here. Anytime you have a two level system that's coupled, you can visualize what's happening on the block sphere. So everything that's described by this rather complicated matrix can be visualized by a vector in a unit sphere that we call the block sphere. In this example, I've taken the simplest case, the carrier. So there's nothing happen, happening to the motional state, but really all that changes is that there's no N here. And here, if, I, it, if it were a sideband, you would have GN and E N plus S here. That's the only difference. You can still think about the block vector. So what does the block vector do? Imagine you have an arbitrary state that's made up of the excited and the ground state with coefficients alpha and beta, because this is a quantum state and you're not thinking about other states. The sum of the moduli of these has to be one. It has, the atom has to be in one of those two states. And that means I can rewrite this in this form here. There is a global phase that doesn't play a role for quantum dynamics. And then I can basically make this coefficient here real every time. So it's essentially the phase of alpha that goes in here if, it, if alpha is a complex number, otherwise this phase is equal to one. And then you can have cosine theta over two and e to the i phi sine theta over two. And what, when you think about these two, they describe a position on the unit sphere where theta is the angle of the North Pole and phi is the angle in the equator. And so in this way, you can visualize any of the states of these two E and G on this unit sphere. G is the South Pole, E is the North Pole. And then in the equator, you can have, for example, combinations with equal amounts of E and G and different signs here. Minus gives you a state that's often uh, abbreviated as minus. And if you have a plus sign here, it's abbreviated as plus. If you're in these orthogonal directions, you would get i's in your description. So there would be imaginary coefficients while these are all real here. But that's the basic idea of the block sphere. So what can we do? The first thing we always use in experiments are these resonant transitions. And this now, after the fact that I told you, I can forget about most of the other levels, will give you a reason why I can actually do this. We have a wonderful technique called optical pumping, and this allows us to prepare states. The basic idea is very simple. Imagine you have um, S ground state, and it has a few sublevels. It depends on whether you have hyperfine structure or not, or whether it's just a single electron spin and so on and so forth. And then of course you also have P states. And because P is a higher orbital angular momentum, you will have typically at least one P state that has more states in it than what's in the ground state. And that means you can use light of a certain polarization, for example, sigma plus and optically pump. You're doing this transition and now you can decay. You can decay this way too, but Sometimes you will decay this way. So you've made one step over here and you just keep going like that until you finally reach a point where you're in a so-called cycling transition. So here you go up to the extreme state 
And the only way you can decay now is back down to the state and you're cycling here. This is good for many reasons. The first one is now I'm really in a two level system. Only these two levels play a role. And the second nice thing is that I can scatter a lot of photons without ever losing track of the internal state in my atom. Why is that interesting? Basically, when I want to detect whether I have an ion in the trap and I'm on such a close transition because I can scatter many, many photons, millions of photons per second, I can see the ion on a camera, for example, or I can see it on a photomultiplier. It becomes a bright dot because it scatters all these photons. And so we can basically detect whether we have an ion at all in the trap. Another case where it's particularly easy to see what happens is if you have an excited state different than this one. So you have this cycling transition here and you have another excited state. So what happens in that case? Oh, actually, this is again a, a good time for questions. So I should ask for questions here before I go to this next case. Okay, so there are, there are some. So I think I'll read this one out. So uh, in Raman transitions, when we change the relative angles of the beams and thereby the momentum absorbed by the ion, how does this manifest? Do we excite a motional mode only for certain relative angles? Yes. So basically, if you use what we call co-propagating beams, the two K vectors are parallel to each other, you cannot put any momentum onto the atom. And if you want to change the motional state in a classical picture, you have to exert a force or a kick onto the ion. So if you can't do that because the two momenta cancel, you do a transition that doesn't change the motion. And then as you make this angle larger and larger until you actually reach counter propagating, that's where you get the biggest momentum. You're changing the Lambdicki parameter. So this parameter that describes, where is it? Um, here, this angle here in, in a Raman beam would now be the angle for two photons. And so it becomes larger and you will have more momentum transfer. Your Lambdicki parameter gets larger and it becomes easier to drive these sidebands. So indeed, depending on what angle you're using, you will get different amounts of momentum transfer. Of course, you also have to be resonant to a sideband transition to have this momentum transfer. Okay, so there's one more question. Um, how about phonon distribution and averaging over the distribution? Yes, I mean, this is almost going a little bit into what's coming next here. This is about how do I affect the phonon distribution and the colloquial term of what we're doing is cooling. You want to have as few phonons as possible. And basically what I've told you so far is just, I have a distribution of phonons and I don't know what it is, but I can take care of that by writing this general form of a state so it can contain any end and then I can calculate what the state will look like because N on the L sideband will only be coupled to N plus L. So basically I'll flop between N and N plus L, but it will happen in parallel over the phonon distribution that you have. And of course that would become a very untractable problem very quickly if we cannot limit how many of the N states are actually participating and that lead directly into the next part of the talk, which is how do we cool the motion? How do we limit how many ends participate? Okay then, yeah, that's great. So maybe you can go ahead with it. All right, let's do that. So the first thing I already alluded to before the questions is that if there is another state, so I have this fast cycling transition that I was just talking about but I also have another state. It could be a D state, for example, or it could be another hyperfine state. This is shown here in beryllium. 
you have 1.2 gigahertz between the two hyperfine states and you could have a cycling transition that goes between here and here. But if you're in this state here, you're not cycling anymore because you're 1.2 gigahertz detuned from this transition here. So what does that mean? In both these cases, what it means is that if you're in this state here, that could be your state E or in this state, the cycling turns off. So either you get a lot of photons out of your atom, your ion, or you get no photons out of your atom or ion and it becomes dark. And that means I can use that to detect which of the internal states I'm in. I can use a fast transition to the P state to either see the fluorescence or not see the fluorescence. This really works in practice. This is an example for calcium from the University of Innsbruck quite a while ago. This E state in this case is a D state and the bright state is the S ground state. We can do S to P transitions. And if we are in the S state, the ions are bright. Here all three of a string of three ions are in the S state and they're all bright. Here, the rightmost has been transferred into the D state. And so it doesn't show up on the camera anymore. Here it's the middle one and here is the left one. This has been done by a very tightly focused beam that addresses the quadrupole transition from, G, uh, from S to D here. And so in this way, you can selectively turn off one of these ions. And the same could happen here. Now you would have to do a hyperfine transition, which can be done with a tightly, two tightly focused Raman beams, for example. So in this way, you can actually detect which of the two states you're in if G and E are narrow, long-lived states. And that's very important for quantum information processing because E and G could be a qubit. And now you can actually detect at the end of your calculation which state you're in. So with that, I'll come to laser cooling. And the first step, I've already almost told you everything about it. It's just a slight change. So far, I told you we are resonant with the cycling transition. And that would be the optimal case to get as many photons as possible. And either see the ion, so you've trapped an ion, you can see it, or you can distinguish between being in a long-lived metastable state that is not this ground state and being in this ground state. If you want to cool in sort of a preliminary and maybe not quite as discriminating of the state manner, this is what we call Doppler cooling. We are still on such a transition here. And typically the P states are not that long-lived. They live a few nanoseconds. So these transitions are tens of megahertz wide. And most ion traps don't have motional spacing that is tens of megahertz. So you're not individually addressing motional levels here on this transition. It's just too broad for that. But you can still just gratitude by roughly half the line width of this P state here. And in this case, this would be a few tens of megahertz times two pi. What happens in this case? You can even think about this in a classical picture. Your ion is oscillating back and forth in the trap and the laser beam comes in, say, from this direction here. If the ion is going towards the laser beam because it's ready tuned in its rest frame, it will see a Doppler effect and the photon will look a little more blue or a little closer to resonance. If the ion's moving away from the beam, it's the other way around. It becomes even more ready tuned compared to its rest frame ready tuning. And this means that the photons that go head on onto the atom will be more likely to be scattered compared to the photons that basically chase after the atom and have a more ready tuned situation. The momentum transfer of a photon that goes head on on the atom is it will slow the atom down. And of course, there's a second part. There's this emission here, but the emission is on a dipole pattern and the dipole pattern is not entirely isotropic, but very close to isotropic. And so that means the photons that are emitted go in all directions. 
if you think about the net effect of this beam is it will be absorbed more times head on than when the atoms going away from the photon propagation. And that means you will um, have a momentum kick that opposes the motion and slows it down. That's the idea of Doppler cooling. And in fact, in ion traps, you can get down to single or maybe tens of quanta, depending on how strong your trap is. If your trap is, say, a few megahertz, you go to the single digits in these ends that are still populated. And this is basically a stochastic process. And what you get is a thermal state. So I shouldn't say state, actually. You get a thermal distribution of these end states. That's, that's what you get from Doppler cooling. And in fact, you get a thermal distribution from almost any cooling method I'm going to talk about. So after cooling, you start in a thermal distribution. And people often talk about ground state cooling. We'll come to that. But what it really means is you have a very small n bar in a thermal distribution. You're not really in the ground state but you almost any time you look, you're in the ground state. Okay, let's go back to Doppler cooling. The nice thing about Doppler cooling is you can understand it almost entirely classically and without even thinking about the levels in the trap too much. You basically have a harmonic oscillator. It has classically speaking this potential energy and the velocity of the ion as the function of time will be just the cosine soidal oscillation. And then the, we already said the momentum transfer is h bar k. So h bar times the momentum kick per sub photon. And therefore we can make a semi-classical approximation. The change in the momentum, the kick you get from each of these photons, of course, is more or less something that happens almost instantaneously in particularly particular, if the trap is not too strong, it happens on a time scale that is much shorter than one of these oscillations here. And that means we can basically think about this as a force if there are enough of these events and it goes as the momentum transfer times the decay from the excited states times the probability to be in the excited state. You have to be in the excited state to have had a momentum transfer. So that's basically the classical force that you would get out of this quantum drive of the atom. And this average force then is proportional to the decay rate and the excited state population. So we would like to drive this cooling pretty hard, but there are limits to it. And basically this is that the excited state population can be saturated. So there's what we call the saturation parameter. It basically compares the Rabi frequency you drive this transition with to the decay rate. And if you make the Rabi frequency too large, the saturation here gets larger and larger. But if you look at the probability to be in an excited state, it can only go to one and it will saturate. So at some point you just have S and S here and you're basically in the excited state half of the time if you look at this limit. And that's pretty intuitive. Anytime you drive, try to drive this transition much faster than how it can decay, you will just have Rabi oscillations back and forth and then it finally decays. So one half is the best you can do in this row E. And then finally, we have this detuning here, delta effective. This is just how much are you detuned in the rest frame and how much does the velocity here contribute? If we are in such a situation, we can linearize the average force close to the final state. So we are getting close to the cooling limit and it looks like this. Basically you have a constant force. What is that? That constant force is just what we call the radiation pressure. It basically puts the pressure on the ion and pushes it in the trap a little bit off its minimum position without the light on. And then you have a velocity dependent force here. And you, you already know harmonic oscillators with velocity dependent forces can be damped if this kappa has the right sign. 
So kappa is a friction coefficient, and I can change the sign with delta. If delta is negative, the detuning in the rest frame, then kappa can be negative. And then over many periods of energy, uh, of, of doing this friction, applying this friction to the ion, you can get an energy three degrees that goes as F zero times kappa times the velocity squared average. So this would go to zero. You could pull all the way to the ground state. But of course, you not only have the absorption, which is described by this term, you also have emission. And this emission basically leads to a random walk, random kicks. And you have to equate the two of them. One is proportional to the velocity, and one is not in, depending on the velocity. And when the velocity gets small enough that the two are equal, that's described by this equation here, you are in equilibrium and you reach pooling uh, equilibrium. I think I'm not going to explain too much about this, but basically the idea is that the emission kicks you in all possible directions. And on average, it's about two fifths along the direction you're trying to pull. And so putting all of this together, you get this equation here for the equilibrium. You basically get KT, which is just M times the average of the squared velocity over your oscillation is given by this expression here. You can calculate what the minimum temperature is. And it's something that's proportional to H bar over gamma, H bar gamma. There's the saturation in here. You don't want to make the saturation parameter too large because it will increase your minimum temperature. So you choose something that's reasonable, maybe one half or so. And then finally, you have the emission pattern in here. That's this, this term here. And it's uh, uh, something commensurate to one. And so typically, T min is something like H bar gamma over two. And it depends a little bit on, on the particulars of your trap. But that's basically what's happening. This is written down here again. So it's roughly H bar gamma over 2 kb. The Boltzmann constant is your minimum temperature. Practically in traps, it's a few millikelvin. And in terms of n, it depends on how strong your trap is, but something on the order of 10 or so is typical. So you get a thermal distribution in the end state on the order of 10. And you can actually play games. You can, for example, cool at high saturation first when you're in a very excited state, you've just loaded the trap. And then you can go to lower intensity because it will decrease your minimum temperature. For the so you can do that for say the last few microseconds of your cooling. And in this way, you get close to the stop the cooling limit. This would not really be a great state to start in. For example, for quantum information processing, you would like to be much closer to the ground state. And so the last part of what I'm going to talk about today will be about getting closer to the ground state. So basically, we would like to resolve the sidebands. The sidebands are given by the trap frequency. So it's a few megahertz, typically. And that means your detuning here has to be much larger than the decay rate of whatever excited state you're using for your resolved sidebands. P states are typically not suitable because they're decaying so fast that it's very hard to have the decay rate smaller than the uh, spacing of the, the levels. So your detuning is just not large enough. However, you can even take states that are stable without any light field and make them effectively decaying. So this gamma tilde here is not necessarily the natural alignments of the state that you're using, but you can use extra laser beams, we call them repumpers, to manipulate this. It will become clearer how this works as I go through it. So in typical situations, when you have a quadrupole or a Raman transition, you can resolve these sidebands. And we assume here that we are already in the lamp Dickey limit, 
because we have done pre-cooling by using the Doppler cooling, which is sort of a tool that works on almost every atom that you can laser cool and that gives you a good starting state. In this case, we can use the interaction Hamiltonian in the lamb dicky limit where we have the carrier and the sidebands as we already talked about. And this is already suggesting that you're in the resolved sideband limit. The width of each of these resonances is much smaller than the spacing between the emotional levels. So what happens? Basically, you have, you're detuning much larger than the effective decay rate. And that means you could in principle drive three of these transitions, you're in the lab Dicke limit, you could drive a carrier, you could drive a red sideband, or you could drive a blue sideband. And we imagine that we are driving close to the red sideband. The upper state is returned back to the ground state in with rates gamma tilde, or if you're on uh, go from n to n plus one or n to n minus one, it's actually eta squared times gamma tilde. So basically you have a small factor squared here to go between uh, n and n plus one or n and n minus one, which means most of this decay will be cha not changing n. n up here and down here is the same. And that's nice because now I can make an imbalance. I can drive on this red sideband. I go from n plus one to n and then when I decay, I will mostly go to the same end. If you look at this whole cycle, you've lost one quantum. And that's the basic idea of resolved sideband cooling. Make a cycle that is dissipative, you have decay here, that favors the red sideband. In that case, on average, you will remove motional energy. And you can then do some more math here. You can, for example, assume that you cool are already close to the ground state. So you only have to worry about the ground state and the first excited state here. And then you can compute those rates just using the Rabi frequencies in the lamp Dicke limit. So basically you have the red sideband and the rate will be like this. It's the probability to be in the excited state, in the first state, in the first motional state because it's a red sideband. So you can only make the transition to zero if you're in one. And here's the rate that you get for that. If you're in the ground state already, you could have scattering if events. So because the line width is finite, and uh, you could also get a scattering event, but it's off resonant. So it's suppressed by this term here. And the same is true for the blue sideband. The off resonance is even larger. It's now a four in here instead of a two because you're even one more motional frequency detuned. But these terms do exist. And in the cooling limit, basically the balance between this term, which is driven by that you're still in the first excited state and this term will become more and more equal because the first P1 will decrease as you cool and P0 will become larger. So basically this imbalance has to fight this imbalance. And when they're the same, you're in the steady state. And this gives you a cooling limit if you just plug it in and basically say nothing happens anymore. P dot zero and P dot one are zero. You get this cooling limit. What does it tell you? Basically, you can cool better if your effective rate here, the effective decay rate of the excited state is smaller. And it will also go like the fraction of the lamp Dicke parameters. One is the one for the cooling and the other one is the one for the decay. They can be different. And then there's this one quarter. So no matter what this is, there will always be this one quarter. And you can approximate then the probability to be in n equals zero as one minus the effective decay rate over two times the trap frequency squared. So this is your cooling limit. And for typical situations with result sideband transitions, this cooling limit can be very small, 0 0.01, 0 
or actually it would be one minus in this case. So your probability to be in the ground state can be 99% or better. So I think this is the last time I want to stop for questions. Uh, there aren't any questions that are actually relevant. Uh, okay, yes. then I'll just continue. Yes, yes, yes. So now you might ask yourself, okay, you're telling me that I, you can cool the iron, but how do you actually know that you've cooled the iron? And how do you find out how cold it is? And it turns out that the same sidebands that we're using for cooling, you can do spectroscopy on those sidebands. And if you're in a thermal state, that is sort of a very special state, a thermal distribution, I should say, because it's not really a state, you're in a statistical mixture of different end states. So the thermal distribution, that is a very particular case because in that case, your distribution between the end states is given by n bar over n bar plus one to the m for the m state. And that means you can actually sum it in two ways. In one case, if you do this for the red sideband, it's this expression here. And this is basically the probability to be in the excited state after I sum over the thermal distribution. And I can do the same thing if I drive the blue sideband. And because of this particular form of your populations in the different M states, N states or M here in, in the emotional state, you can actually equate the two of them. And it turns out there's a fixed ratio between your probability to be excited on the red sideband and the probability to be excited in the blue sideband. And it's n bar over n bar plus one. This means if I try to excite the red sideband, I can do it with a certain probability and I can do the same experiment on the blue side and I'll get another probability. And they are always related in a thermal state by the average occupation of the oscillator divided by the average occupation plus one. If this sounds pretty complicated, you can think about the simplest case and that is you're in the ground state. If you're in the ground state and you're trying to do a red side band, you're trying to take a phonon out of the ground state. It's impossible. You cannot do it. So your probability is zero. If you're in the ground state and you're trying to do a blue side band, there's not a problem. You're going from N to N plus one. So it will just happen, no problem. And that's exactly what this fraction here tells you. If n bar is zero, this whole thing becomes zero because I cannot take phonons out of the, with the red sideband, but I can always add phonons. And basically these transition probabilities just tell you how hard it is to add a phonon versus subtract a phonon. And it turns out for a thermal state, that is a fraction that doesn't depend on what the thermal state is other than on n bar. And so that's how you can find n bar. And in this way, I can, for example, show you an experimental example where we can put all this theory into practice. You can use the quadrupole transition in calcium, for example, it's at 729 nanometers. Then because this D state wouldn't decay on its own, you use a repumper at 854 nanometers. It couples you to the P3 halves there's a bit of a leak going back here, but most of the time you decay back to S and you can do another cycle of your cooling. And because of that leak, you also have to have a secondary pumper laser that takes you back into the cooling cycle here. So once you've done that and you've defined by changing this Ravi frequency, a good repump rate, it shouldn't be too large because that drops your cooling limit to, or actually increase the cooling limit to a higher end bar. You can make it just right by choosing this. You can now do these cooling cycles. 729 nanometer light is not exactly on resonance. It's on resonance minus one motional quantum. And then when you're done, 
you can look at the red and the blue sideband excitation probability. And that's what you can see here. The, this line here is for the after Doppler cooling. So clearly there's a red sideband and the blue to red sideband fraction, as we just talked about, tells you what N bar is. So I think in this case, it's something on the order of two or so. It would be two thirds for N, N bar equals two. And after the ground state cooling, the red sideband is almost completely vanished. There is still a statistical probability that you actually have made a transition here from some time to time. But basically the ground state, according to this thermometry, is 99.9% .9 or so. So you're almost always in the ground state. And for practical purposes, people then say, we are in the ground state for most of the time, or we are in the ground state. All right, the final part, the last 10 minutes will be on how can you describe cooling in general? We started with Doppler cooling, looking at a semi-classical model. So basically we kind of just swept all the quantum mechanics under the rug in that case. Then we've looked at this particular resolved sideband cooling that is easy to describe without a general framework. But now I would like to give you a general framework. So I already in each of these cases said that you want to absorb on red sidebands more than on the carrier and the blue sidebands. And so you can make this formal. You can define a scattering rate that depends on your detuning delta from the carrier say. So delta equals zero could be the carrier. And you want to know how much am I scattering with the process I would like to use for cooling. And this will be given by the decay rate of the excited state times the probability to be in the excited state. And this probability here can be a function of the detuning. So that's basically what we're playing with. A general scattering process will basically go as I go from the ground state and a certain n to an excited state and n prime, and then I decay back to the ground state and it could be n two prime. All of these n's could be different. And what we need to do is, is we find the rates for all combinations of these. And that sounds complicated, but it's not so bad if, as you'll see because we again assume the lamb dicky limit. And that's really what all the papers on cooling have to do. If you're not assuming the lamb dicky limits, n and n prime and n two prime can be very different. And you get a whole forest of rate equations and it's really hard to solve them. If you're in the lamb dicky limit, there are simple rules. The carrier will be proportional to the Rabi frequency squared, your chance of scattering on the carrier. The red sideband will have this factor times n, and the blue sideband will have this factor times n plus one. These are rates, so it's basically the amplitude squared. So omega squared, and then eta squared, and n squared, and eta squared, n plus one, because there used to be square roots for the amplitudes here. That's the whole secret here. And then we basically say we only keep terms that are of this order eta squared or lower. And that means the n's and n primes and n two primes here are cut down to just a few. So n plus zero or plus minus one and the same here. All the other transitions are not important. At the tuning delta now, we can write the total rate. There's basically you transition up on the carrier and you decay on the blue sideband. That's one possibility. You can drive up on the blue sideband, decay on the carrier. And then there is also a rate from n to n minus one, where you drive up on the carrier, decay on the red side band, and the other way around, you drive up on the red side band and decay on the carrier. You may say now, where is R and N? I could write it here, but it's not important because it's not changing the motional state. So I don't care about the, that, that kind of scattering. I only care about which kind of scattering increases the motional state and which kind decreases the motional state. And because of the lamb dicky limit, I only have to worry about the ones that decrease or increase by just one unit. So now we can take these rates 
and can look at what do these rates do to the population. I basically now put it, them into a rate equation. Looks a little complicated, but it's really simple. It just says n goes to n plus one. How can I do that? That's the rate that goes from n to n plus one to n minus one. It's the one that goes with n minus one. And then finally, I have these rates that were just returned from the other states. So that's this thing here. And I can then further simplify an notation by putting in a plus and minus here, a plus here, a minus here. And now I can basically have two coefficients, a plus minus that are independent of n and that describe the whole process here. So all the populations are just connected by a plus and a minus and it's the same a plus and a minus for any n. That's the nice thing. So you can plug in any n here and these stay the same. It's the same rate equation, no matter what n is, just the pn's will change, of course. And so now for the average occupation, for example, you can just sum all these rates and multiply them by n. So you get the average. And it turns out it's a function of a plus and a minus times n bar. And then there's this term a plus that doesn't depend on n bar. And that tells you that at some point, this term and this term will be equal. And that is when this rate doesn't change anymore. Then the whole sum here is zero. And this term here will dominate in the beginning maybe if n bar is large, but at some point n bar is so small that this term here can just balance this term. And that's what the cooling limit means. So the steady state will be just given by this fraction here. And basically in terms of our original scattering rates, it's these two scattering rates over these two scattering rates. And if you look at what they're doing, so they are cooling or doing nothing versus they are heating. And so basically not surprisingly, your cooling limit is determined by the fraction of how many of your transitions are cooling versus how many are heating. We can ap apply this formalism, for example, to EIT cooling. That, that's a nice case where things look pretty messy. You have three levels, you have two different Rabi rates, and you have decay rates that could in principle be different between both of these states. So here's the equation of motion actually just for the internal state. And you would like to bring in your motional states now and calculate what the cooling limit is. So this looks really imposing at the first glance. But with this formalism that I just explained to you, you can look at the atom in a frame of reference where the atom's not moving. So that's what's described here. And just calculate what the scattering rate on these different transitions is. And in that case, you could get a W of delta, which doesn't depend on the emotional state. And as long as you have this expression for the scattering rate, you can get it out of these. And it looks pretty complicated. But again, this W of delta, you just have to look at a few cases for delta to get the cooling limit out of it. So it's a very powerful way of looking at it. And basically what you get in this particular case, since it's a free level system, there's a so-called dark resonance. So another way of thinking about this is, is you're doing a Raman transition here that is exactly resonant between R and G. And that means the population from R can go to G without really populating the excited state. And so that's what basically a dark resonance means. You're just in a superposition of the ground states and you never excite the excited state at that point. So there's this dark resonance here and then there can be a very high scattering rate on the red side band if you choose all the parameters correctly. So I'm not going to go into all the details. You, you can read about this in the EIT papers, but the basic idea is big scattering rate on the red side band. No scattering on the carrier because there's a dark resonance, 
And then there is a blue side band, of course, that will scatter a little bit in this case, because you have this white absorption peak here, which is the so-called bright state. So here's the dark state and here's the bright, a bright state. And so you're in the wing of that. And what you have to compare to think about the cooling limit is not all the details of this. You just have to think about how much am I scattering here? How much am I scattering on the carrier? How much am I scattering on the side plan? This is a numerical example where I could have a trap at five megahertz. That's the red side plan. So that would be my trap frequency. And then very far over here, where it's nothing resonant at minus 80, you have this bright resonance. You don't really worry about it. Your side plans are here and only the first side plans count. So all these, all you have to worry about are these three frequencies here. You will have strong scattering on the red side band, no scattering on the carrier and weak scattering on the blue side band. Your ground state probability will be given by just these scattering probabilities. So no rate equations to solve and so on. We've already done that with this formalism. And the cooling limit is given by this expression here. For my numerical example, it's about two times 10 to the minus two. So I'm basically telling you this peak is about 50 times higher than this peak. That doesn't sound too implausible, I think. And this gives me my cooling limit. You would probably use slightly different parameters if you really want to use EIT for ground state cooling because a 2% probability to not be in the, in, in the ground state is maybe not what you want. You would like to have something smaller, but then things get really hard to see because these the, the, the line shape would look different and I would have a hard time to actually plot it. You would, for example, have a hard time seeing that this is higher than zero that's really the situation you would like to be in. All right, I think that's the end of the presentation for today. And I'm ready to take some more questions if there are questions. Yeah, so there is one question. So let me read it out. So how do you achieve the LD limit exper experimentally? Um, can you repeat the question, please? I think it is, how do you achieve the uh, lamp decay limit experimentally? Okay. Yes, that's a very good question. And maybe I haven't made that very clear. So every experiment with a trapped ion starts by producing an ion from an oven or a similar thing. And you can produce the ion with electron bombardment, or you can use lasers to get one of the electrons off. The point is this ion is very hot and the ion traps intrinsically are rather deep. A typical number for the trap depth of an, an ion trap is about an electron volt. That is about 40,000 Kelvin. So these traps are very deep. If you have no other means of cooling, the first step could be to use a buffer gas. So for example, what people have done before laser cooling is they would introduce helium, for example, at room temperature or maybe even close to where helium actually goes liquid at 4 Kelvin. And then these very hot ions that you just loaded from your oven would scatter with the helium and get to the temperature of the helium. So that was the most primitive way of getting closer to the lamp decay limit. 4 Kelvin is still not the lamp decay limit. So everything we do in the modern experiments is because we can do laser cooling. We can do Doppler cooling. And initially when the iron's very hot, it takes a very long time to cool them down. But we have time because once the laser cooling actually achieves its cooling limit, you're at a very cold state. And the only way you're going to leave it is by background gas collisions, for example. But Basically, laser cooling is the way to go to achieve the lamp Dickey limit. And you need one more ingredient at this point. Your trap needs to be reasonably stiff. Typical experimental values are trap frequencies on the order of a megahertz or so will get you into the lamp Dickey limit after Doppler cooling. So that's where 
people typically start their experiment. The nice thing about Doppler cooling is that it's on a cycling transition. So you cannot only cool your iron, you can also see it because it scatters a lot of photons and you can see that on a camera or a photo multiplier. So without laser cooling, nothing of what I've told you is really possible. And that gets you into the Lampicky limit. Okay, thank you. So there's one more question. Um, so this is, can you comment on the experimental ease of cooling when you play of EIT versus sideband cooling to get close to the ground state? Uh, I think I can do that. The EIT cooling, as you can see here, maybe, I mean, it's a bit hard, but EIT cooling can have a fairly large bandwidth. So it's just the width of this peak here while still suppressing the carrier transitions. And there's actually a technique called double EIT. You need more than three states. Then you can also suppress the blue side band. So EIT cooling can be very nice if you want to cool a relatively broad range of, of motional transitions and you don't want to bother with these side bands. But you still typically have some um, um, probability to scatter, especially in, in, in single EIT, to scatter on the heating transitions. So the cooling limit that you can achieve is often not as small as you can achieve with the resolved sideband cooling. Uh, with the resolved sideband cooling, it's typically so narrow that each of the emotional degrees of freedom of the ions has to be addressed uh, in um, sequentially. So you basically, for every emotional mode, you have to have a few pulses of resolved sideband cooling. But you can then suppress the blue sideband and the carrier, which give you a cooling limit much better. And so at least up to today, the trade-off between EIT and resolved sideband cooling was how quickly and with how much laser power you want to do it and what is your cooling limit. If you want to be quick and with low power, EIT is great. And if you want to have the smallest possible N-bar, the resolved sideband cooling is still the way to go. I should mention that it's not really a rivalry. You can use both of them. You can, for example, use EIT cooling to be pretty close to the ground state with a lot of modes. And then the one mode you want to say, do a two qubit gate on or something more sophisticated, you can cool with a few more resolved sideband pulses because you're already pretty close to the ground state after EIT cooling. And then you can use sideband cooling to make it even better. So I wouldn't say there's really a trade-off. You can use both techniques to your advantage if you're clever. Okay, so um, I think there are some more questions, but in the interest of time, I think we should stop now. It's already 9.40. So, um, but uh, I think we will listen to you again tomorrow at the same yes, time. I hope so. Yeah. Thank you. So, thank you very much for joining in. Thank we'll you. See you tomorrow. I will actually stop sharing now. And thanks for the question and for your attention. Thank you.